Hello, everybody. Um, so I'm here from a company called Antithesis, and I'm going to tell you about a very unusual thing that we've done with Beehive, namely the title of the talk, Building a Deterministic Hypervisor with Beehive. Um, so first off is about a introduction. What is Antithesis? Antithesis is a, we're a software testing company, and in particular, we are providing deterministic end-to-end -end software testing in the cloud, right? And why are we here at the FreeBSD Developer Conference? Well, our deterministic hypervisor is built on Beehive, and it, of course, therefore runs on FreeBSD. Um, this is a project that started about five years ago, so I think FreeBSD 11 initially. Um, <clears throat> and this is kind of the backbone of our entire environment. And, and I'm gonna show you this rather complicated diagram just to understand the whole system that we're talking about, but we're gonna really focus on just the deterministic hypervisor. So conceptually, the thing Antithesis does is we run entire simulated workloads that represent some kind of experiment. We wanna run them in a deterministic environment to, for which we've created a deterministic hypervisor, which we call the determinator. Uh, that, that hypervisor, the determinator, is controlled by a, a piece of software that guides its exploration. It, essentially, it's a fuzzer, right? So there's an external control th system that decides what should be run in the hypervisor, and then we use that to try to find software bugs, and then we take those bugs, we collect them, we process them, um, and we generate reports that we show to our users. And lots of pieces of the system are in flux, we're still developing it, there's lots of capabilities that are growing up over time, but again, I just wanna tell you about the determinator, which is our deterministic hypervisor based on Beehive. Now, the format of this talk is gonna be a little bit funny. We're gonna play a game. Okay, so in these slides, you'll see a question, and then I'm gonna give you a second to kind of think about it. Uh, you can shout the answer at me if you want, you probably shouldn't. I'm gonna give you the answer, right? My answer at least. For some of these, your answer might be different, but if your answer, if you're happy with your answer, give yourself a point, okay? <laughs> like, honor system, I trust you, I believe in you. Um, but that's kind of what we're doing. <laughs> and um, just before we start, th the reason we're here is because, well, we built this on Beehive, it runs on FreeBSD. We're very grateful that we got to build on this platform and we think it's very cool to just share with you like, you know, kind of the joy of doing something unusual with open source. You know, something that that's, Working on this, honestly, over the years has made me incredibly happy, and I kind of want to just tell you about it. <laughs> so we're here to gush. <laughs> um, okay, so let's kind of set the scene here a little bit. Um, so for starters, what's Beehive? That, that's the question, right? And, and I know everyone here probably knows, but Beehive is FreeBSD's Type 2 hypervisor. Uh, right now, it supports Intel and AMD x86. I, there's a Beehive ARM project somewhere that I've followed a little bit, but it's not, I think, in the main source tree yet. Um, it is now. Oh, excellent. Great news, great news, perfect. Yeah, like I said, we started with FreeBSD 11, so some of my knowledge is very out of date. <laughs> um, fine, so that's Beehive. Enjoy your point, if you got a point. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> Keep track of them. <laughs> All right, so what's VMM? Um, again, you probably know. VMM is the kernel module part of Beehive. So Beehive, Beehive is the whole thing, but Beehive is also a user-level application, and that interacts with a VM, but the kind of guts of the VM are provided by a kernel module, VMM. And finally, 
what's VMX? So VMX, which we're going to talk a lot about, a lot, about a lot, that is Intel's x86 virtual machine extensions. So this is invented over the past, I don't know, 10 or 15 years. This is like the hardware support for making virtual machines a lot faster. And AMD has their own completely different ones. I'm only going to talk about Intel because right now our implementation only really uses the Intel ones. It's, this is an area where like it's x86, but they're two like, like if you open up the Beehive source tree, there's just two different directories. There's like, here's all the Intel stuff, here's all the AMD stuff, and they do not really intersect very much. So we, in our development, we said, okay, what does our cloud provider have? It's a ton of Intel boxes, so we focused on Intel as our starting point. So there's, there's almost identical stuff in the AMD world, but it's all subtly different in ways that I have not had to learn how yet. So I'm very happy to just talk about the Intel environment here. So this is all stuff you hopefully know, but let's all get on the same page. <laughs> um, now, okay, let's talk about the other part of the talk. What is determinism? What is a deterministic algorithm? What are the attributes of a deterministic algorithm? Take a moment, think about it. The, there's, there's three things I wanna hit here, right? The, the first thing with a deterministic algorithm is given a particular input, right, you wanna always produce the same output. Determinism, yay. But with the same sequence of underlying machine states. And what do we mean by that? Well, okay, for starters, let's get the obvious thing out of the way. If I give you a different input and you produce the same output, that's not determinism, that's just the input being irrelevant. Right, that's, that's um, but this, this final statement is very important, this underlying sequence of machine states. What that's saying is not just you get the same answer every time, but that the, the internals of the computer, to the extent that they matter, to the extent that they affect future answers, are the same as well. You know, so it's not just you ran this one computation, you got the same result, it's that all the subsequent computations you're running as a follow-on to what you just did, will always also have the same underlying state affecting them. And this is very important because if you get this part wrong, the other stuff doesn't work, <laughs> right? So hopefully we're kind of, you know, hopefully people got some points. Let's get, let's get more annoying, right? Well, okay, first off, why do we want determinism in software testing specifically? You can shout out a guess if you want. Reproducibility. 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 Exactly. And there's our cute little mascot. His name is Snouty. Um, so in particular, in software testing, um, it sure would be nice to like, if you find something that looks like a bug, it sure would be nice to go back to it over and over again to analyze it. Um, this has several advantages. One advantage is you can do destructive things with it. You can say, okay, I'm gonna just like, you know, I think my application crashed. I'm gonna like make it drop core and look at its, look at its stuff and I'm gonna decide, oh, I did that wrong and then go back and being able to try the same situation over and over again is high value. And also, honestly, how many times have you been in a situation where a test failed and you go to someone who's responsible and they're like, yeah, it's a flaky test, right? <laughs> and and how many times have you been in a situation where a test failed once and you're, you're coming back to it, you know, it, it takes you months of rerunning it to be certain that you've actually fixed anything. You know, so that's all some of the reasons we value reproducibility. This is why we're really chasing determinism as the thing that we want. Um, now, to kind of harken back to that initial picture, we're using the deterministic hypervisor for a very particular thing. This is, this is, we're starting with something that's a hypervisor for you to do anything you want with, right? You know, you can, you can run video editing software in Beehive that happens to be on a different platform, stuff like that. You can do all kinds of things. We have this hooked into a particular system for a particular task. And this is gonna come up a lot, come up a lot in terms of the design decisions that we've made and the reasons that we're able to get determinism, which, 
probably sounds a bit impossible if you just kind of say, how would I do that? Why hasn't anyone done that? So um, let's talk about determinism. Is sending a message over the network deterministic? Everyone's shaking their heads like, no, 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 yeah, yeah. Um, and, and you can think of all kinds of reasons why, including this will just fail sometimes. <laughs> Um, the underlying you know, network stack might have to resend things and, and there's latency involved and, and you're, you're interacting with the real world on so many levels. Like this is just not gonna be deterministic, right? Fine, we all get that. Uh, is, so RDTSC, if you don't know, that's just read the timestamp counter, right? That's like a really low level way to just get the clock. So is like reading the clock and then reading the clock again and then just returning the delta of like what you read. Is that deterministic? Again, everyone's shaking their head, which is good, because no, it's not. Like, like, even if you didn't care about what the values were, even if you just wanted the deltas, that, you don't have that amazing amount of precision in the execution of instructions. All kinds of things happen to disrupt that flow. There's branch prediction, there's interrupts maybe, depending on where you are. Like, not deterministic, <laughs> right? And finally, Okay, let's, get, let's go even simpler, right? Let's, let's just say, what if I just, and sorry to switch languages on you, that's very mean of me, but what if I just wrote a literal to a memory address, right? That, that's all I'm doing, I'm just writing one to some memory location, is that deterministic? Getting a lot of no's. <laughs> yeah, like, it depends on how you look at it, right? Like, like you can imagine a world where that's deterministic and you'd have to do a lot of work. So, so that's the first part that we're building towards is, is we're gonna try to make that thing deterministic and, and maybe that second thing you'll see and, and we're just not gonna do that first thing, okay? That's spoilers, we're not doing the first thing. <laughs> um, at least not like that. Well, you'll see what we actually do. So, okay. Um, how do you contain non-deterministic behavior? Like starting from the position that, fine, we just talked about how nothing in your computer does deterministic. It seems really bad, like you're in a lot of trouble. But if you ask your computer what's like 10 plus 10, it'll give you the right answer. Hopefully, like, like or, or you should like hit the chip with a hammer and get a new one. Like, like at the very least, there's some basic things that the CPU does that really feel like they ought to be not deterministic on some level if you can like adjust the boundaries of your abstraction so that the underlying state that you care about is deterministic, right? The, the game we're playing here with determinism is, we say, okay, the machine state, what's the machine state? Is it the state of every electron in the CPU? No, 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 no. We are finding a boundary where we can say, everything below this line can be non-deterministic and we don't care because it doesn't matter. Everything above this line has to be deterministic and then, we hope that nothing in that abstraction leaks, <laughs> right? That's kind of the game we're playing. But we know that the CPU and the whole computer as a whole have a ton of non-deterministic behavior. So take a second and think about, okay, how do you contain it? How do you take all the stuff that the computer does that isn't deterministic and how do you isolate it from what you're trying to do? Give it a sec. There's a couple of answers here. So, one, disable the behavior that you don't want, right? If it's a behavior that you don't need, just turn it off. Don't do it, don't do it, right? Two, emulate it in some deterministic fashion, right? This is why we're using a hypervisor. You knew we were gonna emulate a whole bunch of stuff. We were gonna intercept what the physical hardware is trying to do, and we're gonna, we're gonna try to contain the side effects through emulation. And finally, number three, Try to mitigate it, try to detect it and hide the side effects in some way. Basically, this is a little bit different from emulation because emulation implies, you know, I'm gonna trap it, I'm gonna like not do the thing I was gonna do. And when I say mitigate it, what I really mean is after the fact, I'm gonna just like take whatever bad stuff happened and I'm just gonna make it go away. I'm gonna hide it in some fashion. So that's, the big picture approach to what we're doing is, is we're trying to take this really non-deterministic system, if you look at the whole of it, we're trying to find the parts that are deterministic and we're gonna build out from there and 
we're going to limit what the computer does to make sure that the thing we have left, which is still hopefully fit for purpose, is deterministic. And how do you know that you've actually fixed non-deterministic behavior? Like, like once you've done all these things, you, you spend months and months, possibly years, trying to force determinism on this system. How do you know that you've done it? Just test it. Like, test it a lot. Because there, there's no happy mathematical proof here. This is, this is the world of real hardware. And in that world, you, you can look at the processor manual as your guide. You can look at the processor manual and you can say, golly gee, I think this will work if I do it. Or, hmm, that sounds really suspicious. I should turn it off. But the only way you know for sure is to test it constantly and relentlessly. And the whole time you're developing this thing, Test it, <laughs> right? Which is true of any software, but in particular, there's no backup here. Um, so, okay, so far generalities. Let's get a little bit into specifics. Um, we talked previously, it sounds like time is a major problem for us. It sounds like even just running a single instruction, you don't really know how long that'll take. It's not like a really fixed, perfect, like, oh, this is exactly like five nanoseconds kind of thing. So. How do we make the passage of time deterministic in the context of a hypervisor? Remember, this is a hypervisor we're building. Well, we want to emulate the clock. And so, I should have given you more time to think about that. I apologize. Um, <clears throat> so the big idea here is, you know, just like we do with a lot of stuff in VMs, we don't give the guest any access to real hardware. Um, in our case, we made up this thing called vTime, which is just like virtual time. And every possible time source, you try to read the timestamp counter, you try to read the HPET, all these things, get its value just from this virtual time source. And this is what everyone does when trying to make a deterministic hypervisor. Um, there are many approaches to this. I will tell you, generally, that we were able to do it using the, the PMC counters, which are the like, um, so on the Intel chip, there's all these debugging counters you can turn on, the performance monitoring counters. And we use those to basically count just the CPU, just the CPU you know, execution cycles. And we were able to say for every N amount of work, we're gonna advance the clock by a certain number of ticks. Um, I'm purposefully being a little vague here, that's okay. <laughs> um, so what do you do with that really? Um, okay, let me backtrack. So, so that allows you to solve the problem, well, begin to solve the problem of all these really basic things I'm doing, I'm just, doing normal processing, I'm adding things together, I'm moving things around in memory, it allows you to try to solve the problem of the side effects of that need to be manageable. If I run a program for, you know, a thousand, thousand instructions worth of stuff, I want the clock to always say the same value when I'm done. Now, another big source of non-determinism is concurrency, right? So you've got all these CPUs, they're all doing stuff, and typically in a modern computer, they're kind of all just racing each other. Like, like you, you've worked with multi-threaded code, you've seen all the amount of stuff you had to do to like synchronize the, the data to not cause problems, not, to, not to, to beat race conditions. So how do you fix this on like the level of not just you wanna get the right answer, but you want the whole machine state to be happy and correct and deterministic all, all the time? Well, you could emulate the whole CPU, you could, spend like, I don't know, $50 million and convince someone to let you sign microcode and then write your own CPU microcode and, and then have that like slow the CPU down like tenfold in order to enforce ordering on everything. We didn't do any of that, we just disable concurrency. So <laughs> for the purposes of our system, the gift that we have is 
I can just run my workload on one CPU at a time, right? And if I can do that, if I can get away with that, it is so incredibly valuable to just do that and take a whole class of problems and throw them out, right? <laughs> yes? Go ahead. You run on a single CPU or you run on multiple CPUs, but one CPU at a time? So what I do, um, what we're doing is we're running the number of CPUs that you have is the number of VMs we're gonna start up. Because the thing this is attached to is a fuzzer, right? And a fuzzer wants to explore a broad state space, right? So each machine will only have one virtual CPU. Each VM will have one CPU, yes. And so what that constraint allows us to do is to develop this in a couple of years as a small company instead of beating our heads against it and saying, can't be done, we don't have the resources, right? It's a trade-off, <laughs> but it's almost worth it for the speed up it gives you when, if you're thinking about overall throughput, right? Like the thing about fuzzing, the thing about this, this problem space is it's not individual execution of one thread. I have to see thousands or millions of states. I have to explore you know, everything your program can do in a big tree of, of possible futures. And in that context, like removing all of the interlocks you would need to get multiple CPUs to play together nicely, multiple cores to play together nicely, makes you a lot faster <laughs> in overall throughput and overall value for your hardware. Right, again, this is not a general purpose device. That's the key to like doing a lot of this stuff. And then finally, how do we make the entire physical world that's affecting our, CP our, our computer deterministic? Don't, don't look at it, <laughs> right? Don't, don't, you don't want it. So, so do not talk to other physical machines. Minimize how much you talk to hardware, right? Like every piece of hardware your VM has to interact with is a, an entire device you have to impose determinism on like, like from the ground up. And it's much better to, to cut away what you don't need and to say, you know, do I need a real disk? No. Do I need, do I need a real network driver? No. Like you really want to limit, you want to create this big box. Like this whole project is creating a big box. And inside the box, determinism is happening. And then, okay, fine, but you wanna talk to that box. Like, the big box that's deterministic and nothing works, but like you can't see inside it and you can't influence it, doesn't do anything. So now we get back to how do we deterministically ingest data from the outside world? I can't just create you know, a console port and be like, write to this console port. <laughs> whenever you want something to happen. I can just create a socket. Um, this is where we can use something that to my knowledge Beehive typically doesn't really make use of, which is very convenient because we don't have to override it. Um, so there's this thing in VMX called VM call. I think on AMD this is called, I don't remember actually what it's called, but VM call is an instruction that does nothing. Um, or rather, if you run it just on your computer that's not virtualized, it'll just tell you that that does nothing. If you run it inside a, a machine that's running in a guest OS, it'll just call out to the host. There's no, there's, no, there's no defined action other than cause a VM exit. So exit from the guest to the host. And what this VM call instruction lets you do as a hypervisor designer is you can just have it do whatever, right? You have your own, just slap your own API on top of it and say every time I make a VM call, like read register, I don't know, RAX or something, and, and if that says do this, then read register R8, and then use that as the value for the function you made up. So this lets you create a really efficient communication channel between the guest and the host, if you're able to control the host and tell it, hey, this is what this, this API does. And you can really minimize side effects with this approach. You can say, you know, it's, it's basically an instruction you call it, something happens, like while the guest is frozen, 
and then the host returns control back to you and whatever magical thing you want to happen happens. In this case, we can very use, use it very easily to have IO without side effects, right? You only ingest data when you ask for it and you only emit data when, when you request it and otherwise it's a nice black box, it's very tidy. This is the answer to the question of, well, the, the world outside is non-deterministic, the world inside is deterministic, but in order to run this as a, as a program that does anything, I have to control it from outside and I have to see the results of what I do. Um, so, the next thing is kind of, fine, I've got this interface. The, the way that VM call works, like you make the VM call and you can, in our case, like you can read data in, you can get data out. What if you wanted to kind of more of a push interface? Like just armed with this, armed with this one instruction that just says, when I make this instruction, the outside world is gonna give me, let's say, a byte of data, or it's gonna give me a line of, of uh, command to run in bash or something. What if I wanted to make it so the outside could like control the timing of these things? Give it a sec. I know this is getting a little harder to like follow or to at least to guess. Well, just inject and interrupt, right? Right, do the VM call in the handler, inject and interrupt from outside and say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna run to a certain point in time. I'm gonna, I'm gonna schedule an interrupt at that point and then I'm gonna just do a read. I'm gonna read data in. And so now I've got this system where I've got an outside controller on this deterministic insight. Um, and then, okay, fine, but I just told you there's no disks, there's no network. There's no like hardware, right? And I'm telling you, oh, it's a test platform, right? Ooh, we're doing deterministic simulation testing with a box that does nothing, that has, that has way more limitations than your computer. How do we do that? <laughs> Give it a sec. How, how would you do it? Um, how would you test a whole big system in this framework that's just running on a single core? Well, you simulate a lot of stuff, right? And in particular, you know, if you have a bunch of services, if you have a bunch of servers, if you have a bunch of nodes, put them all in containers, uh, network them via virtual bridge. That is something that, not at a lot of fine grain levels, but at, a, at, a, at the level that, at a lot of levels that you do care about though, that is something that behaves like a big system in a simulation. And if you just did this like on your home computer with you know some big like database engine or something, it would probably not work because it'd be like all oh, my connections timed out, I don't have any resources, I can't do anything. Um, this is the convenience of lying to it about the time. This is the convenience of, of simulating all these things. Um, and then once you start simulating these things, like I'm making use of the guest OS to help me, right? Like, like from, from the get-go, from the VM call, like the guest OS is also something I'm providing. It's tailored to my needs as the person running the experiment. And I can have the guest OS, you know, I don't just have a network bridge, I have a faulty network bridge, right? So this is where the testing comes in. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have the network bridge just like mess up your packets. And, and I'm gonna, every three, every three seconds I'm gonna force a leader election on you if you're some kind of distributed database, for example. Like I can go wild with how, like, like by getting the guest OS to play along, I can get these simulated things to have a really bad time very quickly, <laughs> right? <laughs> and this is kind of what the determinator is for. It's providing the big box in which this whole experiment runs and in that box, we are causing lots of badness to happen very aggressively. And then we're collecting lots of data about what we do and we're using the determinism properties to explore that, that state space of all the possible futures of bad stuff happening and causing you to have a leader election that causes the database to delete itself. Um, as an example, it's not the only thing we test but a lot of our early adopters were people who had these kind of 
I sure want to know if my database can have a million dollar bug situation. Um, <laughs> so that's kind of what we're doing is, is this is a very unusual way to use a hypervisor, which is we're playing together with these other ways of simulating a whole environment. Um, what's next? Okay, so to kind of get back to how you actually build something deterministic, is the TLB, is the translation look aside buffer deterministic? <laughs> no. <laughs> so, so not really. Uh, that should just say no. I was, I was being way too forgiving of the TLB there. So, so what I mean by this is, <clears throat> like, you know, you've got your page tables, and the TLB is like, like caches the result of that lookup, and. It just drops stuff at random. You, there's also like the whole procedure. There's there's TLB, TLB invalidation. There's TLB shoot down, but you're never guaranteed something's in the TLB, right? And this is a great example of like why controlling time is so important, because you know you do something that's just there's just anything that requires the memory access. How long does that take? Well, it really depends on whether the results already cached in the TLB. If it's not, you're doing a multi-level page table walk, you're pop, popping that into the TLB, there's all this stuff happening. If you do just have it all cached, you skip all that stuff, right? <laughs> so this is an example of one thing that's kind of your enemy here. If, if you care about like real world clocks at all, this will completely kill you. Fortunately, we don't, right? Fortunately, we don't, but Regardless, in our world, is the TLB deterministic? Well, now it gets ugly, right? If you read your x86 programmer's manual, there's a great section on the rules for TLB shootdown, right? Or not, not just shootdown, but invalidation. Forget shootdown, we're not doing multiple cores. Shootdown's the bad one. Invalidation, invalidation's easy. Um, there's all the rules for, for invalidation. And you'll notice that some of the rules are you have to do this or your operating system won't work, right? And then there's that section of like optional stuff, right? And um, one of the optional things is if I've, if I've increased my privilege, right? Let's say, let's say something was something wasn't executable and now it is, right? I've marked a page executable. Do I need to invalidate the TLB? Now in the opposite case, if I've marked something not executable, it used to be executable, if I, if I don't invalidate the TLB right away, that's a security hole, like gigantic security hole and everyone will yell at you and get mad. In the other case, most operating systems say, golly gee, I can save myself a TLB invalidation if I just, you know, cause a spurious fault every now now then again because you haven't you've you've escalated privilege like you've gone from not executable to executable and if you don't flush the TLB all that happens is now there's some possibility before it gets cleared out by some other thing anyway that you'll attempt to do something that you by all rights can do and you'll get a fault that says you can't do that but then the operating system will say, oh, that's a fake fault, that doesn't matter, I was just lazy before. And you'll just, you'll just rerun that, that operation and nothing bad will happen, right? Sounds great, sounds great, yay, that's like, in the real world, that's great, that's perfect. In our world, <laughs> your, your guest OS now non-deterministically goes into a handler based on what I'm gonna call non-architectural state, the state that you don't know what that state is. <laughs> that you have no way of like really, really controlling. And, and I said before, my clock runs off of what instructions I'm running, right? Well, now there's a little loop that, that goes through where it just did a couple of extra instructions. So this is the kind of stuff you're fighting, <laughs> is oftentimes everywhere that you can do something slightly non-deterministic, but it makes the whole computer faster, almost every modern OS has done that thing. Right? <laughs> and so how do you deal with that? How do you get the guest OS to play nice? When by default, anything you're using, and we're, 
we're mostly using Linux in the guest, to be clear, because um, that's what, what you run everybody's containers on. How do you get the guest OS to play nice? And I'm going to actually give you some time to think about this. So first thing you can do is, is lie to it. Like, you've got this great facility for the CPU ID, which is every operating system is querying the hardware for like, hey, what can you do? And every hypervisor already lies its butt off here. There's a lot of features that your underlying hardware supports that the hypervisor says, no, don't do that. Don't try. Don't try. So that's the first part. Um, then you can try to interpose and mitigate. You can say, okay, well, fine. You're going to cause a spurious fault. I'm going to trap all the faults. I'm going to decide whether they're spurious. And I'm going to hide it from you, right? This is, this is the mitigation task, right? I'm going to say, no, 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 no. You can't see that that happened, right? This is annoying. <laughs> This is a pain in the butt because now you're fighting the guest. You're going to do this a lot. When you write this thing, you're going to do this a lot for all kinds of stuff. But there is another answer too, which is you modify the guest, right? You go in the kernel and you say, no, I want you to do the nice thing, not the fast thing. This will save you a lot of time. Like, like part of, part of like doing this, part of accomplishing something quickly here is limit your contact surface. Like, don't jump off the, the, the deepest end you can find and say, oh, yeah, I bet I can force any OS to be deterministic. Make the OS play nice, right? Trick it or tell it not to do things or just change it. Just change it. The beauty of open source, the beauty of all open source, Linux, FreeBSD, all that stuff together is we can change what we do. So we, can, we have a lot of control over the interface that if I was trying to run like Windows and the guest, I would not have. Um, so that's a lot of the big picture. I want to kind of take a quick break just, just to pause for a sec. I think there's maybe, if anyone has like foundational questions, I kind of want to get them out of the way. Um, I just want to make sure you're at least somewhat happy that you know where the heck I'm going with this, that I'm not just saying a lot of BS. <laughs> Are we good? Okay, we're good. We're good. Okay. So as a quick summary, <laughs> what have we done? <laughs> or what have I described? You haven't seen me do it. I, I didn't sit at the computer and do all these things. So the Terminator is, starts out with Beehive. We heavily modify it. And we disable a lot of features that we don't need. Not because those features are bad, but because we strategically just identified things that we couldn't do or couldn't do in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, you have to, every deterministic hypervisor has to start out with an emulated time source. That's just kind of pretty much non-negotiable. In our case, we also run everything on a single core. So we get rid of a whole host of problems by just getting rid of concurrency. And finally, we simplify your I.O. down to this one custom designed deterministic I.O. channel. It's very simple. It's basically designed to be side effect free from the view of the guest. And that also removes a whole host of problems because now the contact surface between the deterministic box that contains your experiment and the outside world that contains everything else is as small as we can make it while still being able to control it and being able to see inside. And then finally, in our weird case, the guest image represents an entire experiment. So we run all these containers in there. We hook them together. We have fake devices for them inside the guest. This is what we're doing. And then in terms of practically building this, just some quick notes. Like, the thing that we really learned very quickly was you want really detailed logging as you do this design. Because the thing you're starting with is non-deterministic. The thing you're starting with just does not do the thing that you want the end product to do. But you're starting with a mature piece of software with a lot of components. Like, you're modifying something that already exists. And so, what I very quickly found was I just wanted to log a ton of information every time I was in the every time I was in the host. I wanted to the easiest way to do this is just hash all your registers, hash your memory, hash everything, and then keep track of that as often as you can, and then run in parallel. And the first time you see a divergence, that's the thing you have to investigate. You have to go back and say, what did this? What was the instruction that caused this divergence? Um, 
the nice thing about that is like you can get a, you can read the rip to get the instruction pointer. You can go in your guest, you can look at the, the kernel symbols, you can fire up your kernel browser, and you can say, aha, it's in this function. You know, and if it's the like, oh, the TLB flush function is causing me problems, well, I better learn about what the TLB flush function actually does, right? So the first thing I did actually when building this is not because it's bad, but because it wasn't suitable for the thing I was doing. I wrote my own logging engine. I didn't use the like built-in syslog D-ish type kernel stuff. That's designed for like real people with real systems. Um, I just wanted to capture like a terabyte of data in an hour. And I didn't want to lose a single line. I didn't want like a ring buffer that's like, oh, well, you tried to log a lot of information and I lost a line. You know, I didn't want that. <laughs> and then the other thing I did with my log logs is I tagged them all. I had a counter and every time something deterministic happens, it gets tagged with that counter. And every time something non-deterministic happens, it doesn't get tagged with the counter. And then I just, I can take like 10 or 20 of these things and I can zip them together and I can just say, okay, what was the first deterministic thing? Ah, okay, they all match. Or like number 10 didn't match and now it's a one in 10 aberration, right? So without this, it just wouldn't have worked. Like this was the first thing is like logging. The second thing is very quickly, um, I built the first version of this like in a box under my desk, but eventually we were running these things in the cloud. And so I found it very valuable to like write my own kernel panic handler. Because when you panic the kernel, and, and you do panic the kernel when you write these things because you do things when you shouldn't, because you're manipulating big chunks of memory, you're, you're doing all kinds of things in the kernel, and you're doing them very nastily. <laughs> um, when you panic your box, you know, it drops a little core file, you can go and open it. But in the cloud, unless you take pains to like preserve that, the thing that happens is the cloud provider will just destroy that whole thing. Like your box died, it'll, it'll kill that stuff. And unless you wanna like attach a disk every time and have all kinds of special setup, I found it more valuable to just say, <laughs> you know what, I, I know this panic is probably not gonna destroy like my ability to SSH into the box. I think it's just gonna destroy my experiment. And just being able to SSH into the box and look at it when it's running was incredibly valuable. So this is like another, like I'm not gonna call myself the world's greatest kernel hacker or anything, I obviously am not. But making your iteration loop faster <laughs> was really valuable to me in that way. And then finally to go back to the, like, the, the testing thing, um, what we really found is that like, we wanted to build, build in correctness checks as we were running. At kind of the macro level, at the micro level, Every time we're redoing something that we already have a piece of data that's like, here's how it should turn out, we, we should look at that piece of data and say, okay, I reran this, like I'm, I'm using the determinism for replayability, but when I replay, I should check the result. I should make sure that I did get a deterministic result. And, if, and this way, every test we run is also retesting this component in a way that's more purposeful than just saying, oh, the test failed for a mysterious reason, I have to spend you know, a week figuring out why, and the answer is because every piece of architecture on top of this thing was expecting it to be deterministic and it wasn't. Like, being able to identify these, these correctness problems immediately was really high value <laughs> when we built this. So, fine, we have the determinator, and like any good determinator, it, it should travel through time, right? That's, that's, the, that's the important quality of, of, of terminators and determinators. So let's make this thing a time travel debugger. Um, <laughs> what do I mean by that? Well, okay, so we've got deterministic replay. Yay, hooray. But deterministic replay takes a while. It's replay. Ugh. I don't want to replay states. How do I speed up replay? Snapshots, yes, bold snapshots, correct. Snapshots, take some snapshots. And in our case, we want really efficient, fast snapshots of this very limited system that we've built. So what data needs to be in the snapshot? Now, this whole thing, for reference, the only device it's connected to that's a, anything like a real device is the like AHCI CD emulation, 
And so you're basically just importing your guest OS as a live CD, because that's an environment where almost every OS has a live CD. And the nice thing about live CD is it's already just assuming that the CD itself is just ROM, right? It, that it can't change anything you know, in that giant wad of data. So that wa giant wad of data, you don't have to worry about preserving its state other than like that little device. So given that we don't have any devices, what data needs to be in the snapshot? Like what is a full snapshot of this system? Just kind of. Yeah, sort of. <laughs> yeah, so so yeah, the whole VMCS, all the guest registers, all the emulated device state for your fake little set of devices, and then all the guest memory. So that's that's a lot of stuff, but it's much less than the like how do you actually make a snapshot of normal Beehive? And we built this before the latest round of Beehive snapshotting stuff was available. This is very different. This is, I believe, much faster unless techno wizardry behind, beyond my can has happened in Beehive, it's much simpler, right? Now, of these three things, guest memory, your registers, and your emulated device state, which I just told you is tiny, so feel free to ignore that, which of these are the biggest? <laughs> memory. memory, right? <laughs> Given our read-only devices. So really, snapshotting is mostly about efficiently snapshotting memory. Now, to backtrack a little bit, how does your computer map a linear address to a physical address? Linear address address in program space to a physical address on, on, in RAM, right? Page tables. Everybody loves page tables. Wow. Now, how does BMX, how, how does the like hardware with all the virtualization support map a guest physical address? So what your guest OS thinks the physical address is to a host physical address, i.e. the real address on your, in your real memory. More tables. Extended page tables, EPT, right? More page tables. So we've taken page tables and we've added another layer of page tables to it, which does not make lookups twice as slow, it makes them like an order of magnitude slower. Because every, every page table, a linear address to a physical address, you go through four or five levels, usually four levels, we haven't gotten to five yet, but it's, it's out there. Um, you go through four levels of, of indexing, right? And, and each of those points to the physical address of the next page table down. Well, to map a physical address to a host physical address, you gotta go through page tables. So every single normal page table step is a whole page table walk of this EPT thing. This is still way faster than what, what we used to do back in the dark ages before hardware did this, where you just kind of did this all in software and kind of faked it out, and, and I can't even describe it, but you basically just made your own fake page table and then you replaced it with the real one, and it doesn't matter, we're not doing that anymore. We're doing this. So extended page tables. The nice feature of extended page tables is what happens when an EPT entry, so a line in EPT says you can't do that. When it says, oh, this is not accessible to you, this, you can't keep walking this page table. So in a normal page table, you get a page table fault, right? In an EPT, you get the EPT fault. And the difference is an EPT fault goes to your hypervisor, does not go to the guest. So this is telling the hypervisor, oh, you probably should wanna fill this out. Just like in the normal case with your, your computer, you know, the operating system running some stuff at user land, the operating system could go, oh yeah, I, I can just fill that out, it's fine, it's not a real fault. So we can use this, we can, we can abuse this, right? So let's just, let's just go ahead and say, I'm, I've implemented copy and write memory with EPT, can we do that? <laughs> how do we do it? How do we, how do we use the thing I just said to do copy on write memory? Markham read only. Yeah, 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 you markup read only. You just take away the right permissions on everything. And then every time someone tries to write something, you get an EPT fault saying, ha, huh, the guest OS thinks it's about to write to this location. And then you just clone the page, you make a writable page. And now, the nice thing about this is, usually these writes have pretty good locality of, of reference. Like once you start writing to a page, you're probably gonna write to a lot of that page. Because 
you know, all your program data kind of lives in a tight little area usually, or if you're just like streaming out data like a log or something or just building up a file, it's usually, you know, you start from the beginning, you go to the end, it's pages at a time. So the nice thing about this approach is, yeah, you get a lot of VM exits. So VM exits cost time, so you don't want, you want to minimize them. Here, you'll get a VM exit the first time you want to copy and write something, you make it writable, and then you just aggregate further writes. And so now, armed with that, I can say my starting point is all my memory is read only. And then I want to do this copy on write mechanism to capture everything that happens. <clears throat> and at some point, I'm going to want to take a snapshot. I'm going to want to take all the stuff that's happened since my last snapshot, and I'm going to store it. So when I take that second snapshot, how much of guest memory actually do I need to store? Give it a sec, think it through. Just the stuff that changed, right? So I have a list of everything that's writable. I take all those writable things, I make them a next layer of read-only memory, and I just have a state tree that says, I took a snapshot of everything, and then I took a snapshot of, let's say, 10 or 100 pages that changed, and I took another snapshot, and each one, as long as you're allowed to just reference your parents, each one can be very, very small, comparatively. And what you're really taking advantage of here is, you know, programs like to keep their data in like a pretty orderly shape, sort of. Maybe I'm being a little optimistic, but. <laughs> um, so, so these things can actually be really small. And they can also be really fast. Because how do you load a snapshot? Like, if all I'm storing for each snapshot is just some changes, it's just some changes, I don't need to rewrite the contents of memory. I just have to save all the non-memory state, just save a bunch of registers. Oh no, it's a couple of kilobytes, let's say. There's a lot of registers on a Cisc machine that you don't think about. But just, just save, the, save some registers. And then for all the memory, all I'm doing is remapping. I'm remapping an EPT. I'm not copying around whole pages of data. I'm just changing one entry to another. So I'm just keeping a narrow, small set of diffs. And that is actually amazingly fast <laughs> in the context of our system. Like it makes, it makes it very easy to go down a certain path and say, what happens if I do this, if I do this, if I do this, and then backtrack and say, okay, now I want to see this other result instead. And this is a very impressive result. You can do a lot with it. Um, interestingly enough, once you've done that, once you have this mechanism, how much state can the VM share? Remember, Beehive, the way Beehive is implemented, every VM has its own Beehive application user level. But it's all talking to one kernel module VMM, right? There's different threads, you know, each VM has its own thread because it's the user process. But it's all in the kernel, all that data is shared. How can the VM share snapshot? Can I have VM number one save a snapshot and VM number two load that snapshot? Yes. <laughs> it's just a bunch of read-only data once you save it, right? And, and all those pages at the kernel level, they're all shared. You don't care. It's, it's, it's actually really nice. Um, now, to back, I'm going to get to that in a second. But the really nice thing about this with our model of, OK, I'm doing a big parallel experiment, is if I told you I'm going to take, take an experiment that represents multiple machines, right? I'm going to put them all together in simulation. I'm going to run it on one VM, right? Well, multiple machines usually take up a lot of RAM, right? <laughs> you know, most people's big cluster, cluster-ish database applications, they're probably not going to run in like a gig of RAM. Right? And I'm telling you, I'm going to start one VM per core. OK, where do you get the RAM? Where do you get 20 gigs per core? No machine has that. That's a weird machine. But I really want to make use of all the cores. Now, though, they're sharing all that memory. Right? If they all start from the same state, like let's, let's, say, the size of my, let, let's say the working size of my image is 20 gigs. They all start from the same state. I need to just, just get one machine through startup, make that 20 gig snapshot, and then the rest of them load it read only. And so I'm actually 
not only am I being faster, I'm actually able to use all my resources on, the, in this, mach on this machine. I'm actually able to share so much of memory very, very flexibly <laughs> because I wanted the snapshotting capability because I didn't want to bother to replay everything from the start, right? This is an amazing leg up for actually getting decent throughput out of this machine that I'm torturing very weirdly with these VMs. So now, can the different snapshots share their changed pages? This gets a little ickier. This is like, you could probably come up with a way to do this, right? And so they can, but you have to be willing to reference count and deduplicate, and you have to be willing to trade some time complexity to say, okay, have I actually seen this page already? Or is this, is this really a duplicate of something else I've already done? I'm not gonna go into too much detail about whether it's worth it or not. This is actually, we're kind of in between how we do this because we decided that there's trade-offs that we kind of have different ideas about whether the trade-offs are worth it or not. Um, but you can, in fact, you can trade a bit of computation time to like try to deduplicate these things and get even more efficiency. You can really squish these things down and try to make the most use of your memory, or you can be a little bit more laissez-faire about it and just run very fast. And then, okay, you have all these snapshots. You're probably making a lot of them. Can you delete them? Can you forget them? As you're, as you're running, as the whole system is going, all these snapshots only exist, like, forget about like cold storage, like pretend these are all just hot snapshots. All that matters is like during your, your big, you know, multi-hour exploration of a program, can you delete these things? So the answer is yes, but you might need to do some housekeeping. You might have to be like, well, my children care about these states, I have to like pass it on and, and I can't just delete some pages. It really depends on implementation details. They're kind of a little, don't really matter. But at the very simplest, like if you just have a leaf somewhere, if you have a state that like, you know, you spend 10 minutes getting to a state and you made a snapshot of it, and then you spent 10 minutes exploring what follow-up futures can happen from that, that situation. You got a lot of value out of the snapshot being there, so you didn't have to spend 10 minutes each time replaying it. And then you said, okay, I'm done with this one. I don't care about this. I don't care about any children of this, this possible future. Just clean them all up. It's really easy. It's really tidy. So this is pretty powerful without a lot of effort. This is... This was very quick to implement. I was shocked how fast this fell out of the other stuff. And I was also shocked how much more efficient this made the whole machine. Um, and that is time travel debugging on top of this, this determinator thing. So, okay. Kind of adding it all up. What do we have? What, 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 what did we make? What did we do with Beehive? Um, well, we made a deterministic hypervisor the determinator that deterministically reproduces a certain workload state. We support many VMs exploring in parallel, partially because we made design decisions that forced us to do this if we wanted to be efficient at all, which was very smart on our parts, but also very lazy. That's the best combination you can be. And also, like, it's a pretty handy time travel debugger. Like, once you have determinism, it's a lot easier to you know, <laughs> snapshot things and reproduce them. You get a little more value out of it because now instead of just run this snapshot and then immediately diverge and it doesn't really matter, now it's run this snapshot and every time I wanna see the thing I already saw, it takes me 10X or 100X less time. And so that's the big kind of thing. That's the big picture of this component. Um, and then, in terms of like where this is going, what we're doing with it, there's always room for more optimization. You know, I've described something that's a kind of, it's not a prototype, this, this exists, you can pay to use this, please please pay us to, to play in our sandbox, it's great. Um, it's amazingly powerful, we have plenty of testimonials about how great this is and, and um, it really does feel really cool to use too. Um, but there's room to optimize the back end, like, there, there's always room to optimize the back end. And especially as your trade-offs change over time, you might go back and even just say, 
oh, I optimized this once for one use case. I'm going to optimize it for a different use case now. Um, you can certainly get more flexible with the I.O. channels, with the output capture. Um, and a thing that would be very nice in our case is also to kind of make the guest image, the system under test, a little bit more hot swappable. Like, I'd really love to just say, mm, I did all this setup stuff, and then at the end, I'm going to, like, hammer in, like, a small patch. Or even, I got to a fail state, and what if I change one line of code? Could I maybe hammer in, like, a, you know, two-line patch <laughs> in a state I'm already in? Like, this is still experimental. We're still working on this. But this would really be the next, the next valuable thing to do. And finally, like, because this is running on like, the Amazon Cloud mostly right now, um, when Beehive has ARM64, which apparently is, is actually now, um, I would eventually like to do this for ARM64. The, the caveat there is all of the stuff I just described, I have to start again from scratch. Because this is all the behavior of the architecture. And yeah, it's kind of in the processor manual, but is the processor manual telling you 100% the truth? It's not lying to you. It's just like, this is reading between the lines and guessing. And it's saying, well, I bet the implementation of this has to kind of give me this guarantee that no one ever spelled out because they don't want to promise you that. That's insane. Like, so eventually, I would really love to play with the ARM side of this. And, and I'd be happy to do the you know, AMD stuff if there's any reason, but it's basically the same machine when you're done. Um, but that's actually a big lift. Like, I think it would be easier to do the, like, let's do surgery in guest memory on the spot to change the program that you're running than it would be to like, support new architecture. But that's the kind of big, big place where we're going with this. Um, that's kind of it. Like, I'm, there's going to be a lot of questions. Also, hopefully you kept score. I should have, you know, or just as vibesy, it's fine. There's, there are some prizes. Uh, you don't have to tell me your score to get a prize. Just come up and get a prize later when, when we're done with this meeting, okay? <laughs> like, like, I don't want to be like, now let's fight. Let's see who's the best. Um, but I do want to, before I open it up to questions, I just want to say um, we have a nice website. We are interested in... People want to work for us. We're interested in people who want to pay us to test their software. Uh, we're also in a context that matters a lot for open source software. We do have a program for the like tiny neglected open source things where the one maintainer is like making all the world's clocks function. We do have a program to nominate those, and we'll try to test them for free if we can figure out a way to test them. So. So very much like right now, this is a bespoke complicated system. It's, you know, this is, <clears throat> there'll be more individual level stuff available later. Right now, this is targeted kind of, it's not just targeted at big companies, but it's targeted at companies with, with resources to, to pay for all this compute. But we do have a program also for open source stuff, like load bearing open source especially that that we'll try to take a look at it and say, is there a way we could test this and maybe give you some bugs and say, hey, there's a security flaw or there's a stability flaw that could affect like all of industrial society, <laughs> um, you know? And hopefully you all have some questions because I just told you a bunch of weird stuff and said, yeah, you can do it. You can just do the impossible thing. It's fine. You'll be happy. <laughs> So you mentioned for testing the smaller open source projects and so on, if you could find a way to test it, what kind of things are practical to test with this versus <coughs> which are maybe much more difficult at the moment? So um, we're actually pretty good at finding ways to test a lot of stuff. Um, there's there's the, the thing that's not super practical to test with this right now is if you were like, hey, I want to test a you know, kernel bug, right? Because 
I'm, I'm using the guest OS to, to do fault injection. I'm using the guest OS to kind of manage things a little bit. So we really started with concurrency testing primarily because, sorry, this is more going to business models than the hypervisor, but we started with concurrency testing because that's where people were like, I, I really care about finding very deep down, like bespoke weird bugs in strange interactions of all these systems. Um, we've tested games successfully. We've tested, you know, crypto is another area where this is just concurrency testing again. That's not really a surprise that like the crypto people care. Um, we do other kinds of fault injection. We honestly, the other thing that we found is a lot of modern software that, that you're used to just running on modern hardware. The timing environment that this is in is not like a perfect replica of a real world computer. It does surprising things, it interleaves things in surprising ways. So a lot of software that's like, well, we think it's resilient, but we're not sure. Just being, just, just, just loosening the guarantees that you get from running on a real machine and being like, well, this thing that happens one in a trillion times now happens one in a thousand times. It's like interleaving or something. Like you find a lot of bugs really fast sometimes because you're able to just kind of change the like very fabric of like how time flows. You're able to like, I, I don't have a hard like, no, I can't do this for you uh, because we find a lot of ways to test a lot of things. Like it's partly what we, we do. Would uh -huh. it be practical to test something like ZFS, considering the, like the where we can compile and run the test in user space <coughs> where it's not in the kernel? Um, I think it would be a bit of a lift, but I'm not going to say no. Okay. So, so you know, it, that that's a yeah. Like, I haven't thought about it. Okay. I don't know enough about about the the contact surface with ZFS exactly, but I would certainly be excited to try. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, so can you give sort of an example of something where you found a bug that, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to sort mm -hmm. of categorize the kinds of things <coughs> that you're finding that people had been, you know, trying to find and then you were able to find when they hadn't. Um. trying to think. Unfortunately, I don't have the case studies, customer case studies memorized. There's a bunch on the website. And I don't want to just be like, oh yeah, you know, company XYZ had, you know, this this problem that we fixed, right? It's kind of um I mean, the sort of things where you have sort of bad traffic coming in or is it race conditions? There's a lot of race conditions. Um so Classic example is, you know, you have your distributed database and you have strange interleavings of network traffic that cause, anytime you like have a partition especially and suddenly you get into leader elections, you get into duplication, you get into all that weirdness. Like being able to really perturb that over and over again. Mm -hmm. And in particular, this is where the like rest of the platform comes in. I'm, I don't mean to make this a sales pitch, but to understand why this is valuable, I kind of have to talk about it, right? Um, so if I find something that looks like a bug, and then the fuzzer backtracks and it says, huh, you know, one second before that, there's this kind of weird little log message I've never seen before, right? So, so do that, use the time travel, go back, and then try different things and see like, once I've seen that log message, am I like doomed to failure? Or like, am I, when's my like 50% to failure, right? Like, I found one failure here. Is that a whole class of bugs? Is that a whole class of failures? And you can kind of do, one of the values of this isn't just, <clears throat> honestly, one of the things I tell people is also like, run this and it'll turn up some bugs that you're like, I'm afraid to fix this. I'm not sure this exists in the real world. I'm afraid to fix it, like in terms of time commitment. But even then you can just keep it in your back pocket and then a month from now, if you're like, oh, I got that weird use case. Like, that's real, that bug is real. You can go back and say, oh, Antithesis found something like this. Let me play with that one. Give me back that one, unfreeze it. Um, 
the, there's also like a property-based testing component to this. I don't really talk about this. It happens at a different level. So nowadays, if you instrument your code with almost like assertions, but you can also have like a sometimes assertion or a, I, I visited this path or I've never visited this path assertion. And then we can say, oh, we triggered like this, this, we got it down this path. We got it down this fork that you can see. I don't think I answered your question. I'm sorry. Um, what kinds of stuff can you find? So very weird interleaved control bugs in distributed databases or other distributed systems are actually remarkably easy to find if they exist. And you know, that's high value to find them, like everyone, and, and they probably exist in your system. Like no one writes a perfect database from scratch. Um, we've done normal style race conditions. Um, we had a video game actually where we found just a normal like strange couple of behaviors happening at the same time. I don't, I'm not sure if it, was, if it was threading related or something else, but we've done that kind of thing. Um, and because inside the box, there's also just a bunch of fault injection that just goes like nuclear on your stuff. Like a lot of things that are very normal classes of bugs where it's just like my system has a certain amount of resilience to like disk faults or to network faults or whatever. Just upping that fault rate catastrophically without destabilizing like the test harness itself is like high value because you can say under this amount of pressure like things start to break down. And, and you know, sometimes you'll look at that and you'll say, okay, I can live with that. And sometimes you'll look at that and say, oh, I didn't expect that to happen. I was hoping my system was more resilient than what I saw. Um, so it finds a lot of things. It, it's very functional, but you need all the other layers working together to like guide the exploration. Yeah, well, I mean, having had worked on device drivers where, you know, something happens and it, it goes crazy and then you don't know how to reproduce it. Yeah. Being able to reproduce it lets you get confidence that you actually found Yeah, something. that's the highest value. And and there is, like, the thing to be aware of is, like, I did say, you know, the same inputs, same outputs, underlying state, right? Once you're in the realm of did I fix it and you're like, okay, I went through a whole version change and I'm running the different software, now you have to hunt for it again, right? That's a different input, right? You have to do some hunting again. But it does give you some good degree of confidence. And we do have pretty good reproducibility with aggressive searching over time. Like, like, we don't have perfect confidence that if you ship me the next version of your software, I just will find the exact same bugs if they're still there. But we have fairly high confidence just from doing it a lot. Um, sorry, that's too much of a sales pitch. I should be more humble. <laughs> well, that, that, you answered the question, thank you. Okay. <laughs> we got one here, we got, all right. One of the changes uh, to the guest test you do, I'm sure, is uh, tweaking the random generator yes. to be predictable, right? Yes. So, uh, so as I understand, the product works by uh, you have, let's say, a bunch of knobs to uh, mm -hmm. to tweak timing, to tweak like seed for the random generator and mm -hmm. stuff like that, and you run those all of those and see which set of knobs actually triggers some bug, right? And then you can go from there. Yes. And reproduce. <clears throat> yeah, so you're right. So 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 that thing I talked about with the VM call, right? Attaching that to, to random, to dev random, do random, all those things. Right. So that then every time I send a value down, it's like reseeding your RNG or it's adding to it. Um, that's a way of controlling stuff. Um, we actually have this whole Like, like, because you can just push in arbitrary commands, we have this kind of mini language that we're permuting where we, we, in that little mini language, we say, now do this kind of thing. Now I want to see this kind of fault. And if this kind of fault causes this behavior, I might permute it and say, okay, now do the same kind of fault, but make it shorter or make it more expansive. Or, you know, so there's different, the knobs are getting much more advanced. The starting point is exactly that. It's like change you random. It's like, just just randomly like hit things with a hammer and see what happens. And then the exploration part is now we wanna manipulate that history and try like, for example, if I have a history of like, if, if my faults are like scripted, right? 
I can take this long sequence of events, and I can try to trim it down, right? That's a popular thing to do, is try to minimize the reproduction of something. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility if you build the guest to have these controls, to be able to tell it what to do, to be able to script it, to be able to command it in various ways. And there's a whole t bunch of harnesses. I don't want to talk it up too much. Like it's, you know, nothing that you probably haven't seen before, but in this environment, it becomes a lot more powerful to just have a fault injection harness of any kind because of the reproducibility. We're doing the running thing again, yeah. aren't we? Yes, yes, brilliant, first. perfect. Thank you so much for doing this for me. <laughs> oh, that's no problem. I'll just keep asking questions at opposite corners of the yeah, room. Yeah, yeah, that's, really that's the pattern. best way to do it. That's the best way to do it. No, no, no. About time travel, I wasn't yes. clear if you can like proportionally speed up VM execution and just like hit the gas and go faster than real time. So, <clears throat> So most of the time, you're going to be going slower than real time because you're doing things on one core. And the benefit is really the overall throughput of the system. Um, to be clear, you're still testing like multi-core workloads. You're just using the OS scheduler to kind of simulate that. Um, anytime the system does just try to sleep, for example, you can skip large chunks of time, though, right? If you tell me I'm going to sleep, I'm going to, I'm going to wake me up, you know, I can see all the, the interrupts that are queued. I know nothing's gonna, external's gonna happen unless I've decided that it happens. And so if you just tell me, uh, yeah, all my threads are done, sleep for like, I don't know, 10 milliseconds, I'll just tell you 10 milliseconds are up, congratulations. And there are some workloads that run faster than real time because of that. Are there any components that are suitable for upstreaming? Hmm. At this time, not so much because of how much of this was taking things away. And there's also the dimension of this is the foundation of a much larger system. Our hope was always that eventually this, comp this type of thing is going to be commodity relatively. Like as long as we're kind of the only people in the market doing this, we don't want to just be like, here, you know, big company X have all this work for free. That's kind of the joy of the BSD license, right? Is like we were able to develop this with the confidence that like it could pay for itself, but then we're not stuck being the like sole owners of it forever. Because like the thing that I have now, you wouldn't want it in the shape that it's in. Not because it's like ugly and prototypey and stuff, but because you'd have to figure out how to merge it back with, with a completely different system that's, that is designed to just kind of replace, right? That's kind of the answer to the upstream question. But we're not banking on this being like our super secret proprietary tech forever. We're just happy to like have done this. We're very impressed that we were able to do this because some of it's, we wouldn't have done this if we thought it was completely impossible. But we are very happy that it worked the way that it did. Like there's some pleasant surprises when you go down this road. I hopefully have communicated that. And also, honestly, it's kind of fun to discover just what you can do with, you know, commodity software that we're all familiar with that many, many people have put many years of work into. And that's why you're able to build on top of it. That's why it's, you, nobody wants to build a hypervisor from scratch. Oh, okay, lots of people do. <laughs> um, <laughs> Nobody who has a company that needs to like succeed or fail, you know, with, with money <laughs> wants to build a hypervisor from scratch if they can avoid it. Like that's 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 academics and hobbyists, and I love them to death. But we're so happy to have this platform to build on top of. And the upstream question is hopefully answered by that a little bit. Are there things that were missing in FreeBSD that would have helped you? Things like platform support of some kind? Or, or mm, good question. <clears throat> I, I think for the thing that we're doing, uh, it's 
got our bases pretty covered. Like, like there, there are a couple of limitations that have more to do with stuff that we've done, uh, you know, our own upgrade cycle internally and, and some other stuff like that. But um, I've, I've found, like, for making a weird hypervisor that runs in the cloud, this has been a really good experience. And the Beehive architecture is very friendly for that. It's very easy to kind of compartmentalize it. I found it very easy to, you know, add syscalls and have it do weird stuff and like completely change the like underside of it. And as someone before this project, I, I'd done kernel development before, but never on FreeBSD. And just I know this will sound like baby stuff maybe to some people, but like even just like the RB tree is nice and some of the like spin locks and stuff and, and a lot of stuff made me happy. Um, my one place where I was tearing out my hair briefly <laughs> was that when you're in this particular space, you know, you've got your kind of object oriented dish C, so you put like VM underscore blah, blah, blah to do VM stuff, right? And then you need to do some weird thing with, with pages and suddenly VM is the virtual memory subsystem and you're like, oh no, oh no, it's the same. <laughs> like, <laughs> maybe, maybe 20 years ago we could have foreseen that and like named them something different, but, but really, like, space? we've been pretty happy. <laughs> You're not the only one to lament that particular Yeah, choice. yeah. And, and you know, I, I was able to, like, like, being able to cheat and do weird stuff here and there, like, like I was able to figure out a lot of stuff very fast. I was actually really impressed with, like, I, I'd done Linux stuff before. Um, I was impressed with some of the stuff that FreeBSD let me do very quickly with scatter, gather type stuff that, I, I, I don't have the full list of stuff in my head, but just just like, if, if you know what an OS does, like the FreeBSD version of something is usually not very confusing. Sometimes it's a little idiosyncratic, which is fine. That That's how you make your own product. But it was very rarely like deeply confusing. And I was very happy for that. Anybody? Okay, I think, well, okay. I think actually in terms of time, because I need a Oh yeah, we're gonna run out of time we're soon, or we've already run out of time. But thank you very much. Um, thank you for having us. Um, so, I'm gonna swap laptops, so you can okay. have a couple of minutes to talk about toys, if you wish to, or, okay. or uh, oh, um, things. Yeah, there's, there's kind of random antithesis swag. By, by all means, I know I told you to keep score, that's only for your own benefit. Um, <laughs> Feel free to talk to me afterward. I love to talk about this stuff. Um, and, and thank you again for having us here. And also, thank you for building all this stuff. Like, like legit, like, like one of the reasons we're here is like it feels really nice to just say like, hey, we use your stuff. It's pretty cool. We did cool stuff with it. And, you know, hopefully you feel appreciated. Because we do appreciate you. Thank you so much. So thank you all for coming. I do have slides, so I'll, I'll be misorganized, so I'm going to have to, while I wait to reboot, I'll scatterbrain. Uh, I did mention the survey earlier, so in a second, <laughs> I'll be able to show you the uh, URL, and I'll end with a QR code that should be big enough, even from the back of the room, to work on your phone um, or other device. So we do have a survey. We would appreciate you filling it out. Uh, we are looking forward to having at Dev Summit here next year as well. Um, so keep that in mind. We're always looking for um, what?
No, I have it unplugged from here. It's my laptop. It's not your stuff. Okay, good. No, it's. I won't name who is responsible because I don't know. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, oh, that might be why I didn't see it. Oh, that's kind of cute. Dang it, it might have worked because <laughs> I had I'd intentionally rebooted on purpose so that it would work. Ah, uh, that's okay. Ah, uh, well, you know. Sometimes, you know, very bright in certain areas. You know. <coughs> um, anyway, not like we'll pull you off my thought. Uh, for next year, we were always um, looking for various things to help make a summit work, as I'll get to when I get to the end. Um, some of the things we look for that are very helpful are sponsors. Uh, it's always helpful to help subsidize the cost, especially for some of our developers, um, in terms of, you know, we got to pay for the food and the rooms and so forth. Um, we're also, though, the biggest thing we do every year is finding content. So be thinking about something you might be willing to talk about or a group discussion you might want to chair, similar to how we talked about RE this time, um, or even one or this discussion about bylaws. So, you know, thank goodness you did not listen to me talk for two days straight, right? That would have been a bug. So uh, content is actually the biggest thing that we need to make Dev Summits work. So keep that in mind. Now I'll try to do this uh, one-handed. One should make, yeah. Usually passwords are not meant for this. Hang on. Almost there. Okay, now that that interruption is over. So uh, this is kind of the last things we'll run to. So to start off with, I mentioned that we like sponsors. So let's thank the sponsors we had this year, starting with the FreeBSD Foundation. <laughs> uh, thank you to Scale Engine for being our video sponsor and hosting our restreaming services. Uh, ooh, is this not, oh, it's just, oh, the animation didn't work. Okay, so I got defeated. So we'll get to the ones at the end that you see the whole time. Um, first of all, uh, thank you to our speakers, my lack of doing PowerPoint. Um, so thank you to our speakers for the content that we needed. <laughs> thank you to all of you for coming because, uh, as you can see, um, many of these talks in the, in the sessions were interactive, and so a speaker alone by themselves would be, they, they wouldn't enjoy it, and it wouldn't have been enjoyable for anyone else either. So thank you for coming and participating. <laughs> thank you to Diane for once again stepping in uh, to, to handle our group photo. Uh, thank you to our live stream team. Uh, for keeping us on for all sorts of people who aren't here to see us. Um, which reminds me, I guess, even we have attendees who weren't physically in the room who also contributed with our, especially with our 1590 session and so forth. So thank you all for that. And for all your comments on YouTube and other places. They're appreciated or something. Um, <laughs> thank you to our AV folks from U Ottawa and the support we get from them. Uh, and also to BSD Can. Uh, it, 
every year we get a lot of support from BSD Can. Um, we're not a purely self-contained conference here. We're definitely piggybacking, and same with Euro. So we get a lot of support from our local conference organizers. They give us a lot of help. Uh, and then lastly, um, I've ruined the surprise. Uh, we do have a group of folks who sit and plan out uh, our summits. Uh, I know like this year we probably started in January working on this one and we'll, like, we'll take a few weeks off before we start planning for their Vendor Summit um, in the fall. Um, so folks like, uh, and I'll kind of not miss them all, um, Ed and Ann and Deb from the foundation as well as Lauren. Um, I think, who else? Am I missing anybody? I'm looking at Ed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of. All right, I think that's it. Okay, so thank you to all our folks who have helped out. <laughs> and then here's your survey link. I'll leave this up for a while. So take a picture. Please go fill out the survey um, and give us any feedback you have. You can email the whole group at devsummit at freebsc.org. Uh, and then we'll see each other. We have two days of conference left, so you know, don't be shy. We all know each other. Uh, have dinner, yada yada. Woohoo! See you next year. <laughs>